Hi everybody, uh, I'm just here with Robbie Paul. Robbie's a, professional, a former professional rugby player, as many of you will know. Uh, at the height of his career, achieved everything. Uh, he's a TV pundit and professional businessman, and he's just going to share his thoughts uh, and the challenges that he went through as a professional player, both in the professional game and personal, that uh, the state of mind plays and mental well-being plays in your, in your life. Over to you, Robbie. Over to me. <laughs> Okay, okay, where do I start? I, I guess you've you got to start right back at the beginning. Uh, when you're a young fellow and you you have a dream in mind, you know, you sit out with this plan, you look. I remember being six years of age, I remember me going to an international rugby league match between Australia and New Zealand. I remember at the 80th minute the referee blew his whistle and my dad left me over this white picket fence that surrounded the old international park in New Zealand called Carlow Park. I remember running onto that field and my legs going like the club was going and pumping as hard as I can, running up to my hero, which was a, an Australian, would you believe, at the time, uh, a guy by the name of Wally Lewis, King Wally as we call him, right, Billy. Um, I remember looking up at him going, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, can I have your autograph? And handing out my program, he signs it. And I remember that being the day that the seed was planted inside of me about wanting to play international rugby right, league. I'd been playing it the game since I was four years of age in New Zealand. Uh, but it was about, I remember, I remember that day as clear as, you know, as clear as it was yesterday. And that was the day that the seed was planted about becoming an international rugby player. And I think throughout my whole childhood, that dream sort of snowballed and it grew and it grew and it meant that I became very, um, very uh, focused on trying to achieve that dream, the ultimate outcome in being a professional rugby player. I didn't want to get paid to play rugby, what I got into it to do was to play international rugby and that was what I was focused on. I wanted to pull on that black and white jumper with the silver fern over the, over the crest of my heart and um, that became all encompassing but as a young person you always look up at that at the internationals and the professionals and you just think to yourself man wouldn't that be fantastic mm. look at them they're on the on the in new zealand because the highest profile sport is rugby you become you're on the front page of the newspaper not the back page you are an uh, a-lister celebrity so to speak and you look at the tra trimmings and trappings that come with it uh, and you think to yourself how fantastic that would be and you just think to yourself as an amateur player somebody who just goes through life uh, you think to yourself oh being, being a professional sportsman must be just as fantastic as it is now but you get paid to do it and you get to buy a whole heap of bright shiny things <laughs> and toys yeah. which is like and, and you know ultimately effectively what you're doing is getting paid to, to live every little boy's dream and that's the role about in the mud with your best mates wrestling you know <laughs> you, you can imagine it that's the, the, the most fantastic thing about it and you, so you, you get that opportunity and you're, you're, you're so desperate the window of opportunity comes along and you're so desperate to sign that contract on the bottom line and uh, you, you really truly believe you don't realize what the lifestyle is going to be like. Mm. So you sign on the dotted line and then you come into this environment and it's a really strange environment. It's not the normal world. It's exciting, but it's extremely also hyper-masculine. Mm. It's a never say die environment. It's a masculine, it's a, it's a man's man's environment. Uh, and it's propagated by the coaches, the senior players, uh, middle-aged players and the junior players as soon as you become a part of it and you yourself start to promote it and drive that type of environment and to a certain extent you need it the 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 game that you perform in 80 minutes of basically it's not a contact sport a contact sport is a sport like basketball and football what rugby is either code is a collision sport and it's about chucking your body directly in front of someone else who's chucking their body directly at you and um, you need to have a certain type of mindset that creates a fearlessness in you it's not normal standing in front of someone that's running as hard and as fast as they can at you is not a normal thing to do most people 
step out of the way. It's built into every creature's core fright and flight. So the, the, the environment that you come into as a young player is, is one that you have to get up to speed with extremely quickly. So you are brought into this environment, you, you're told, you're taught, you're promoted to fight and scrap for not every metre, but every millimetre, every centimetre. It goes down to the smallest little bit of detail. You're competing in the gym, you're competing on the training pitch, you, you learn wrestling, you're competing in the wrestling, you swim, you're competing while you're swimming, you're competing all the time, and it's for those little millimetres. And that creates this expectation that you pour upon yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you were very young when you came over, so you left, you left home, left your family, you came over at a very young age, and you hit the height of your career, at, again, at a very young age. And how did that impact you? You, you were just explaining that the, the masculine environment and the, the bit of a, that fighting to fight every millimetre. And I guess over the, and your career was a, quite a very long career, a successful career. And it, I guess your mindset changed over that career. But how did you handle all that pressure at 18, 19, 20, 20 camp, being a captain and winning everything? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, that's not easy. It's sort of like, uh, you, you try to, what you try to do is you stay very hyper focused on the ultimate goal, the end game. And whether that be um, winning silverware or whether that be pulling on an international jumper. For me, again, I was still driving towards my ultimate goal, which was yeah. that dream of pulling on that jumper. Um, grand finals uh, and uh, medals and pats on the back became part of that process. But staying in that, staying focused on the ultimate goal was, um, I became very fixated and almost you know, put in the tunnel. Yeah. So you're already in this bubble that's not normal, yeah. and then you put yourself into a, a even further internal bubble to drive yourself towards achieving. That. Yeah, and that, and you you read um, people that have been successful in business, other athletes that are successful at their sport. That's what they do. That's what you do. It's how you become hyper focused on achieving whatever it is that you need to achieve, and that. Um, that comes with its own bunch of pressures. So you're right, you know, for me, I came from the other side of the world into a new, not only a new um, country, but a new culture, culture. a new yeah. environment. Um, I came with a young family, so I was the only breadwinner. That created expectation, that creates pressure. Uh, in, a, in a young relationship as well, you know, in a, uh, me and my partner, we were both still children, came here when I was 18, she was 19. Uh, when we had a child, uh, the normal factors of life creates pressure. Yeah. And so you, you are, you know, you, to, to a certain extent you use the luxury of being able to hyper-focus on an end game as a way of um, push, pushing everything else aside. But the reality is, you don't put it, as, you don't drop it, it's just pushed aside so it's there. Suppressed. Yeah, it's yeah. suppressed. And in the environment that you're brought into, emotions don't exist. No. There's no place for them on the pitch. You have to be, you train repetitively, clinically, over and over and over again. So once you get into fatigue mode on the pitch, muscle memory kicks in and you're doing the quality things over and over again. There's no, there's no place for emotions. You've got to go into the game with the same mindset every single time. And that's the reason why that environment is the way it is, because you can't think, well, today I'm happy, yeah. or today I'm sad, I'm not going to play well, you know, because that has an effect on the way. Yeah. When you go into the game, you basically take yourself up and out of being normal, just off to the side a bit, and then you're in the game bubble. Yeah. So there's bubbles within the bubbles. And it, um, one thing that I came to learn over the time that all of these things start to mount up in pressure. In pressure. You know, I was, uh, I was given captaincy at 19 years of age, wow. for the first time at the Bulls. And, um, and there was a couple of years where I was club captain, but for the majority of the time I was also club captain and team captain. Uh, and so from early age I, I learned the responsibilities of those sort of things. You know, there's, so you, you've got 
the team that have the response, you know, the, the pressure's on you. You come, you're in a hyper-masculine environment where you're not taught to deal with your emotions. Yeah. And the emotions aren't anywhere to be dealt with in that bubble. Yeah. You know, you, you know, if you've got emotions, then you've got to deal with them on your own. But emotions are seen as a weakness. Yeah. Especially in that environment. So you just learn to deal with it however way you choose. Um, you have the expectations of not only yourself and you, you're normally your hardest critic, but the expectation of the person that you're trying to impress, which is normally your coaching staff and the, the head chef, and then you've got the expectations of the administration staff, which includes the directors, and they, they can always be quite intimidating. Yeah. Then you go a little bit wider than that, and you have the expectations of the supporters and the pressure that that lends, because they're all wanting you to do one thing, and that's win. Yep. No matter how you do it, but win. Play well and win. And then all that, and then actually you have the uh, bigger area of the community that you're representing as well. And then on top of that, you have what the sport stands for and the responsibilities and uh, values of the sport, and you become, you, you start to live in a little microscopic world yep. where everybody knows you and everybody um, recognize you and everybody judges every little thing that you do um, and then more importantly as well you go home and you've got this family that are depending on you to put food on the table pay the mortgage put you know blankets on uh, on them clothes on their back and that is your that is that is a, like a primary need and a primary pressure for yeah. you and all of that start starts to layer upon layer upon layer. So you've got the normal pressures of being just human and then you start to layer it up by having the pressures of being a professional sportsman, living in a, in a hyper-masculine environment, working in a hyper-masculine environment, living in a microscopic world. All of these things layer. And yet, again, you're in an environment where you're told emotions are a bad thing. Emotions are not needed here. We don't talk about it. We don't deal with it. Does that cross over then when you're in that professional environment? Does that cross over into your person? Certainly when you're a young, young person, does that cross over into your personal life? I as will well? say it definitely. It's got a, it's got a <coughs> um, psychological stress. Yeah, will always manifest itself unless you deal with it. It's always going to manifest itself. So if it can't manifest itself in the environment that you're a worker because it's just not allowed and it's a weakness, and then you will be seen as weak and yeah. then potentially not, um, not uh, employable, then it's got to manifest somewhere else. Now, in most spaces, it'll, it'll, it'll manifest at home. And that's where you do things that are uncharacteristic to you. It's, you've not been taught how to deal with these emotions, mm -hmm. so you take them home and they are re released in a different type of way. And there's different stages. Luckily, for me, luckily, I um, well, I survived and I'm <laughs> retired now. So you get to the back end of your career, and at different stages, different things put pressure on you. You know, for me, uh, injuries are another one. Yeah, I was going to get a lot of the players in, in, in whatever sport. Injuries are a massive pressure, aren't they? Yeah. How are you going to recover? How long? And you intimated in your book when you're when everyone's training and you're not and you're recuperating the frustration that there is and the, the pressure there is that you want to be there training and the pressure to get fit maybe sometimes before you you, sh you should be out the, 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 for a rugby player for a professional sportsman the darkest time is always going to be when they're busted when they're injured and, and it's it's just a time where you feel less than human your job is to go out and compete and win yeah. That's what you get paid to do. If you can't go out and do that, then you're an outsider looking in. For me, I used to throw myself into the promotional work because then I used to think to myself, well, at least I'm earning my keep. But it's not the same. No. You know, as much as you want to dress it up. And also the environment and the, the culture within the, 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 the team itself, it's a family. It's a very, very intimate family as well. You are shoulder to shoulder with your brothers. It's a lot of people liken it to being, being in the trenches. You know, you go through the same things, you go through the same pressures, you understand one another, and then you go and deliver, and you do that together. We're all in this together. And when you're injured, and you're 
completely separated from that. You have to stand from the outside looking in. And the longer you're injured, you feel the more separated from it you become. And the longer and further and further away, you can't, you can't be, become a part of that family. And to be honest, as a player, you're not, and when you're playing and you're fit, you don't feel that way towards that player that's injured. It's just the way the injured players feel. And that creates a darkness within you. It creates a real frustration. And you know, you, there may be a lot of things that you can do, but there's that one thing that's stopping you from doing what you get paid to do. And that creates pressure. And that creates a, a world of pressure because you start to think, oh, are people talking about me? You know, mm -hmm. they're thinking, oh, you know, am I really worth my money? Or oh, I've had a couple of back-to-back -back injuries and I haven't played a lot this season. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when, it, when it's good, life is really good as a professional sport, really good. But when it's bad, it's really bad. It's really bad. So those, that thing, that type of thing, and you know, it's a, like I said before, it's a collision sport. No matter what, you're going to get injured. There's not a single professional athlete that does not get injured, a professional rugby player that does not get injured at some point. And that is just the, 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 the reality of playing this type of sport. And sometimes you'll get unlucky and you'll have back-to-back -back injuries. Yeah. You'll fit, and then another injury comes. And everyone will go through those stages. And uh, again, what do you do with that frustration? Yeah. Again, you're not taught to do anything with it. You know, it's not... The place where you spend most of your time and you invest most of your energy, it doesn't have a place there. It doesn't have a place there. And then you'll come to the back, as I talk about in, in my book, and I saw this, and it was something that probably I didn't experience as much myself, but you come to the back end of your career, and, you know, things were fantastic. You're 29 years of age, you, you're at your peak of your game, you're the strongest you've ever been, you're smarter than you've ever been as a younger player. You can... You understand the game inside and out, and you get your, you know, you get a contract, two year, two year deal, which is fantastic money, and it takes you to 31. But there's a, there's this weird thing when you hit 30, you're now on the downward slope, and everyone knows that, and people aren't busting their door, your door down to get to you, to offer you a lot of money. And uh, I, I speaking to a lot of my peers and a lot of other players that I spoke to. Uh, they were four or five years older than me. They went through that transition before I got there. They were telling me what they were, you know, what they were going through, and say, you know, they were pre-warning me about getting ready for life after rugby, because a lot of them had fallen on some really, really tough times. Uh, they got to that point in their career where no one was busting their door down. They weren't getting offered a lot of money, and for a lot of them, they didn't get offered any money, so they had to return back to the real world. And, but they were only skilled in one area. Yeah. They was playing rugby. Mm -hmm. All the jobs had been taken up by the players that had gone before them, coaching jobs. Yeah. So they really didn't know what to do with themselves and they fell into a real pit of, of depression. A real pit of depression. And it's something that they, they really, really struggled to come to terms with. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you get those things. And these, this is what I did experience. You know, you go into the field, you I mean, I played till I was 35, so I had a good career, but at 34, I'm getting supporters yelling from the stands, oh, you're over the hill, and, you know, hang your boots up. And you know that you're getting to the back end of your career, and you know, you're getting these reminders as well, you have a lot of them. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is, because you're going home at the end of the day, and you're, and you're looking at your mortgage, and, you know, we're in the middle of a recession, and you're thinking to yourself, for me, I was lucky enough to recognise that, that happened to players before my time. So I put myself back through education and I'm really big on making sure that the younger players around me are prepared. You don't think it'll come so quickly, mm. and it does. It sneaks up and it smashes you in the teeth before you even know it. It creeps up and it just absolutely blindsides you. And it did for so many of my, my peers. And luckily for me, they went through that before I did. So I was able to recognise that and do something about it before it became an issue. But again, that is an area that is still under under exposed yeah. and needs to be dealt with. So you've still got this generation of players that are going through it. Yeah. So they're going home and they're feeling that pressure coming on them. And again, they still don't know how to deal with it. As a professional player, are there any telltale signs that some of 
us in the, in the, in the business, in, in, in chaplaincy and pastoral side, that can see anniversary of Terry Newton's death, obviously Gary Speed in football, has really put a, a spotlight on mental well-being. And uh, it hits us all, I guess. I guess for normal people, we call it a midlife crisis. I guess for professional people, it comes sooner because their career ends sooner and then they've got another journey to begin. Is there any telltale signs that you would, you in hindsight, recognised or is it different with everyone in the professional sport? I think it's different with everyone. I think some people go through turning woods. I think some people, uh, they, they, on the outside, they look like they've got it all covered and that's what you're taught mm. to do. You know, it's a bit of a masquerade you're taught to. You know, step up a lip and just get on with the job and make sure that um, you never show weakness. Yep. And that's the thing, you, you become an expert on pretending you're tough. You, you'll have your doubts, you'll have your doubts about your own abilities. You'll have your doubts, you know, you'll be injured, you won't tell the coach because you want to play. Yep. It's a big game or you feel like you have to play and you'll be busted and you're only at 60% and you'll be injured. And you, no, no, you, you become very good have been able to ma mask all the real issues that you that you have because that's the type of environment. On the field of play, you're never going to show any weakness to the opposition. No. On the training pitch, you're taught to never show any weakness. When someone goes down injured on the field of play, players around them will say, get off the ground. You know, you'll be, get up, and you'll get up. You'll get up. I, I remember talking about in the book, a Brendan Dwyer player I played with, tore his arm two weeks before the Challenge Cup final. Two weeks we played the Challenge Cup final, we won. The following week, a tore his bicep, his right bicep, his left bicep, so it was pretty much on one arm. The following uh, week we played hole, and he went into a tackle and he tore the other bicep. Effectively he had no arms. Got back up again, got back into the defensive line, ran forward and made a tackle with his shoulders and his head. I mean that stuff creates legend. The coach shows you that stuff. Mm -hmm. he, he shows you, you know, this is what it's about. It didn't come off until we got the ball back. He was running up with the line. No one really ran into him anyway because he's one of those players who never used to run into him. <laughs> you pay the price. But that is the stuff of legend. Uh, me, I remember my, my lip being split up up here and my teeth had gone through the bottom there, straight back up again, broken nose off to the side, and you straight back up again and you, you come off when, once you've got the ball, but you don't put the team. And you became very, you become very good at masking any, any type of um, weakness. Yeah. So emotion, remember, emotion is a weakness. So I, I, for me, for me, I, I used to, I read a lot, and I've always been uh, interested in reading. So I went through a stage of reading a lot of new age reading, and what I was, the luxury I had was when I recognized, and I didn't, and this is the thing also, you don't realize what you're going through mm. until a lot of the time it's too late. Totally. And for me, I remember I, I hit rock bottom one time because I pushed the police officer in the street. I was drunk, and uh, uh, I was having an argument with one of my best friends who I grew up with and we were, you know, two drunken idiots just having an argument and a, and a police officer came between us thinking we were having a, uh, it was, you know, and I've told him to, 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 to well, push him and say, look, go away, mind your own business, this is between me and if what effectively is my brother, because we do, we grew up together from this, this high and you don't do that to a police officer. And I remember throwing in the in the in the, um, in, in the lockup for the evening. You know, they, to, to be honest, they were they were good as gold. They said, "Look, Robbie, they knew who I was. They were, Robbie, we want to put you in the cells, sleep it off. We'll let you know, we'll let you out. We won't press charges. We'll let you out in the morning, but just go sleep it off." And that was a wake up call for me because mm. I respect the law. Uh, my family members that are police officers, I understand what they go through and and I have the utmost respect for them. And for me, I, I thought, whoa, where are you at in your life where yeah. you think that it's okay to do something like that, it doesn't matter. And, and again, I was looking at the amount of alcohol that I was consuming as a, you know, as a role model, as an athlete, should I be consuming that amount of alcohol? And I, um, I contacted the, the club doctor and I asked him, did he, could he uh, refer any good counsellors? So, it took a lot of courage, though. 
It did. It, it did take a lot of courage, but for me, I wasn't happy with me. Mm. And the way I looked at it was treat your brain like another muscle. We refine our muscles day in, day out on the pitch. And the brain is the most important muscle, mm. muscle of them all. Without the psychological, without the, my psychology and my um, attitude being in the right place, I cannot deliver on the field. Mm. If I'm worried about what's going on off the field, I'm going to be distracted and you need to be focused. I knew that. And so, yes, it took, it took courage to take that first step. But once I started going through the process, I started becoming a stronger person, mm. even stronger. And I was able to, to live up to those ideals that I'd set myself, um, live up to the values that my parents had input into me from a young person. And it's, and it's constantly, always evolving, yeah. constantly going. I've, de- I've seen uh, counsellors, I've seen hypnotists, hypnotists for mm. the, some neural programming, so to speak, and just uh, just whatever it takes to be better. It's kind of like, I've always looked at it, there's a better way of doing something, find it. There's been some that I've seen be absolutely rubbish, but there's been others that I've been able to talk to and. And I think that the, the best bit of insight probably is for for you guys. For you guys, is ask questions. Yeah. You know, sit down. Uh, the, the, I believe there should be a program where every player uh, at different stages in in the season is made to sit down and talk about things. A lot of the time, you don't even know what's going on. A lot of the time, you're so focused on other things, you don't, you can't see what's going on over here and how things are piling up and it's not until it's too late until something really bad happens and you've lashed out mm. and you've hurt yourself or you've hurt someone really close to you or you've created a whole bunch of new pressures for yourself because yep. you've done something very public. Uh, things that you never believe possible to be able to do but again pressure out this way of releasing itself and we have no control over that. It's a, if, if we can get to it before it becomes a problem, then we'll be able to, you know, to, to sort it out and fix it and be, be better athletes, be better role models, um, adhere to the values of the sport and, be, and ultimately be better people yeah. and more successful. Yeah. I know that over the, the, the sport that we've been involved with, you've been involved at a professional playing level, that uh, the whole aspect or the focus, because people have recognised the, the mental well-being is really important. Not just you're not just a slab of meat, but as you've already explained, that your your, your brain is the most important muscle, and that impacts how you think, how you are. Uh, and, and before they've ignored that, but they've re- I guess over the last number of years they've recognised that if you're feeling good, you're thinking good, you're everything, the whole person you'll be much more effective on the field and I guess from a professional point of view on reflection have you seen uh, a significant change and I guess we're on a journey as, as, as a professional sport uh, you mentioned in your book uh, the rugby warrior your, your whole section on state of the mind and you mentioned some helpful points that state of the mind have put out there and I guess state of the mind's only been around a few years uh, are those things really helpful? They are they are uh, they, you know, in there, there there's, I think they've got a top 10 tip list and they talk about things I've been able to talk with people. You know, I think a real good thing is, is people that know you, yeah. you know, your mum, people that you can talk to or uh, a best friend from when you were younger, people that, you know, stay in touch. One of the things is staying in touch. Being able to talk about these things be, is a, is a format, form of way of getting rid of it. I think, you know, obviously I come from a masculine environment and background, dealing with men all the time. And I think uh, if I reflect on um, the way when I listen to my daughters speak, when I listen to my wife and her friends speak, I think they've got it right, you know. Like going to their hairdressers and stuff like that <laughs> and chatting about things, it's just a form of getting... Yeah getting rid of stuff and you if you understand understand that if you don't get rid of it it will come out yeah it will come out in the wrong way you've got no control over it and you know doing simple things like um, you know uh, 
understanding the your consumption rates of alcohol because that's a lot of the time when it comes out. Yeah. You know, and when it, it comes out in the wrong way, yeah, you, you, you're good as gold, but you have a few drinks, and next minute you're 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 ranting and raving about something that is completely. Everyone's going, what's he on about? But that's actually getting rid of those fears, those pressures that you've got. But if they're not there, if you've got rid of them already, you'll probably be, you know, be able to deal with things a little bit better. Um, don't, don't be afraid to, 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 to get some help. I know players that have um, had injuries and they've gone and paid for their own uh, physiotherapy. It is, it is just treated like a muscle. Mm -hmm. It is the most important muscle. In the book, I write about um, things that separated me uh, from other good athletes, phys you know, other athletes that are physically as good as I was. Why did I go on to be a professional and they didn't? Why did I go on to represent my country over 30 times and they didn't? And I broke it down to these four aspects and they were, um, I call them my ass factor. So attitude, uh, responsibility, sacrifice, and education. These four things, you know, I, I had the correct attitude, and the attitude was the most important thing. Um, I was responsible, you know, I accepted the responsibility of everything that came with being a professional sportsman. I was willing to make self sacrifice, and uh, I was willing to open myself up uh, to education in all its forms yeah. academic as well as life. So I was willing to constantly evolve, so A-R-S-E, my ass factor. Maybe these, we need to encourage a lot of guys to... Well, <laughs> well if you have factor. a think about it, none of knowledge. these, these are the things that separated me yep. from, being, from those other athletes. These four things are not physical. These are all psychological approaches. Mm -hmm. Having the right attitude, yep. accepting responsibly, making a mental decision to accept the responsibilities that come with it. When you make a sacrifice, you have to say, will I do that or will I do the right thing and go over there? It's a psychological thing again. And education is being able to absorb everything. It's, this is the most important thing. This is the thing that separates the, good, uh, the great from the good. This is the thing that creates the international players. Is this, 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 this psychological approach. Yeah. It is the most important muscle that we have. Muscle. It's the most important one that we have, and unless you've got that sorted, the rest of the if you can be as big as a house. I know, I know so many players that are big as a house and can run like the wind, but are absolutely rubbish yeah. because it's just not there in the head. Yeah. And as such, it needs to be kept on the right track. It's just like you refine your chest, your your legs, your core muscles. We work on these constantly, every single day. So they're in their peak, uh, peak performance. You need to do the same thing with your brain. If there's one thing that you could leave with the guys and the chaplains, uh, what would it be one thing you could say, take note, or this is how you could help, or this is how you could be much more responsive? What, what is the one thing that you could leave with the guys that they could take heed of? I think, I think, the, I think the biggest thing that they can do is constantly remind the players, yeah. constantly remind the players that you're there. Let them know you're there. We're there. I'm there to talk about anything. Yeah. And um, let them know that their brain is a muscle. And if they're letting home pressures, pressures from the job, get in front of them, it's going to affect their play. And you'll probably see that more players will start opening up and coming and actually. Because uh, as, as long as I've known, there's been so many players that have actually fallen to those. Yeah. At some stage, every single player that I've ever played alongside have been going through hard times. And whether it be um, injury, whether it be gone out and had a few too many drinks and done something stupid, whether it be uh, can't quite get into the team, frustrated and can't get into the team by doing everything that they can, they will need some support. They will need some support. And as long as, uh, as long as they, you know, but they need to be reminded that the support set. Remember guys, I'm here. Um, we can talk about anything. Just want to have a chat. Let's come, please. Open door policy. We'll, uh, we'll organise some time. We'll have sit down, have a cup of tea together, and we'll just have a chat and see how things are going. That's brilliant.
Robbie, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, Robbie has got a book, Robbie Hunter Paul, Rugby Warrior. It's got some great things in there, so if you want to go buy it, I'm sure you can get it from any good bookstore. I said I'd do that for Robbie anyway. But Robbie, I want to thank you for taking your time out. Thank you for sharing, being honest, and uh, wish you all the best in the future. Right, Cheers, thank My you. Pleasure. Take care.